Today is June 30th, 2018. We are at the Museum of Northern Arizona during the Hopi Festival, and I am interviewing uh, Willard Maktima. Maktima. Maktima, thank you for correcting me, uh, <laughs> who is a member of the Hopi tribe. He served uh, in the U.S. Navy from October 1948 to July of 1955. He was born at Kings Canyon in um, 1929, right? Right. And uh, my name is Jolene Pearson. On camera, I have Clint Lisk. And so, Willard, uh, tell me a little bit about your family background. Where do you want me to start? Wherever you'd like to, sir. Okay, well... <clears throat> My mother and father are from the uh, Hopi Reservation, and uh, they came, they were born in, uh, uh, my father was born in Old Oribe, Arizona, my mother was born in, uh, in uh, Hopeville, Arizona, on the Hopi Reservation. Uh, they originally uh, lived in Old Oribe Reservation, but they had a dispute there among the clans. So the one group of the clans moved to Hort Villa. Hort Villa wasn't established at that time. There was just pine, uh, cedar trees there. But since they were moved out of the, this one clan was moved out of the, the uh, Old Oribe, they, they made them move out and go, they were supposed to go to another Indian site, which is all uh, north of, north of uh, Old Raibi, where they had a settlement there a long time ago. But during, they left during September in the winter months coming, and they didn't think they could make it that far to the old ruins, so they settled over at the cliff and at the end of a cliff at Hot Villa, and they stayed there and they just decided to settle there instead of going all, all the way up north to where they were supposed to go, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the weather, yeah. uh, where the cold weather was setting in. So they just built homes there and established the village of Hot Villa, and that's where my mother was born. Okay, and uh, so your mother moved to Kings Canyon? No. Uh, she got pregnant and they had a government hospital in Kings Canyon. Oh. And okay. then she, they went there and that's where I was born in the Indian Hospital at Kings Canyon, Arizona. Oh, okay. Yes. Good. Uh, all right. And so uh, tell me about your childhood a little bit. Um, my childhood, I was originally raised on the Hopi Reservation at Hope Villa until about, I was in the age of about three years old. My dad got a job at Winslow with the Santa Fe Railroad. And <clears throat> so we moved, he moved us into Winslow. At that time I had an older brother named Lauren. And then uh, there was me. And uh, that's when we moved to Winslow. And my job, my dad had a good job there with the railroad there. He worked in the machine shop at, for the Santa Fe Railroad. And then he also worked at the ice house where they make ice. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then all of a sudden they had a strike at the railroad uh, company. And uh, people were going, uh, asking for a raise. And that's the reason they were striking, you know, uh, raising wages. And my my dad was on the um, the side of the people that wanted to raise, you know. He was, so he was one of the protesters. Uh, but the Santa Fe won their way, so all those that protest against the Santa Fe were fired. Oh dear. So he they he got fired from the Santa Fe. But we never left Winslow. We stayed there, and he got jobs in town, and he worked here and there in town in Winslow, Arizona. But every summer, we'd go to the reservation, you know. So he tried to raise me out there to come uh, 
acquainted with my culture and my people and my relatives and everyone, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'd go out there in the summertime almost every year after I was born. <clears throat> then after that, after I got into school age, uh, I went to um, grade school in Winslow, Arizona, first grade up to the eighth grade, and then to the Winslow High School. And uh, I went to school uh, in Winslow my freshman year, sophomore year, and my junior year. I finished my junior year, and I was ready to go in my senior year, but I quit high school in my 11th grade and joined the service. But uh, at that time, uh, <clears throat> Okay. So you didn't finish high school? No. And you joined the service? Right. Why did you choose the Navy? Well, my brother was in the First World, I mean, Second World War, you know, and he told me about the good things he experienced while he was in the, in the Navy at that time. He said, you get three meals a day, sleep in a clean bed. <laughs> he said, join the Navy when you get old enough, you know, so... He was more or less, you know, gave me the inspiration to want to join the Navy. Okay. So where did you go to sign up for the Navy? Well, I signed up in Winslow. In Winslow. But I went to Flagstaff for my preliminary uh, physical exam. And then from there, then I went to Los Angeles to take a physical again. And then from there, I passed the physical, and then they sent me to boot camp in San Diego. Naval, uh, Naval uh, Training Station. Okay. And had you ever been on the West Coast before, seen the ocean? And oh, yes. Uh, I, I, dad, my dad, when he worked for the Santa Fe, we used to go to L.A. for you know, on his vacation. Uh -huh. And we'd go to the beach. He'd take us to the beach and I'd go swimming. Okay. So yeah. it wasn't a big surprise. No. Uh, <laughs> but it really was fun when he was working, you know, but after he got fired, our uh, economically, our plan kind of went down, you know, because it wasn't getting st uh, steady paychecks anymore. Right. Yeah. What was boot camp like for you? Boot camp was, uh, I enjoyed it, you know, because it was something new to me. And uh, I met a lot of n different nationalities that I made friends there with, which I never did in high school, you know. Of course, I went to school with... Uh, in public school, I met a lot of white kids, but not not from different parts of the country, you know. Right. And I learned about, you know, where they come from, what they ate, their way of living, and, you know, because there were different nationalities in the Navy, you know, mm -hmm. especially in boot camp. Right. You had people, you had Mexicans there, Spanish, colored, and different European, you know. Right. Uh, any other Native Americans? No, I was the only one there in that camp. But there was some there, you know. But I just happened to be in the company. I was the only Indian there. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long were you there? In, uh, you were I think we were there six, six months. No. Yeah, let's see. I went in October. Eight months. Okay. And you enjoyed that? Yes, uh, uh, I liked it because, you know, they taught you discipline, they taught you uh, leadership, they taught you uh, physical hygiene, you know. Right. You had to wash your own clothes, you bathed every morning and night. It was a good experience for me. And a lot of these things we didn't have at home, you know, when I joined the service. Right. Okay, so uh, what kind of military training did you get? Boot camp? Mm-hmm. Uh, mostly just marching and uh, <laughs> naval history. You know, they taught you naval history. Okay. And they took you to the Pine Range over to the Marine Base and Camp, I think it's Pendleton. Mm hmm And that's where we did some uh, small arms firing, you know. Okay. Get, get acquainted with uh, weapons. And uh, and they taught us uh, firefighting on ships, you know, and gas. How do you cope with gas attacks? 
Mm. That was really interesting. Okay, and um, so after you le after your basic training, where did you go? After I got out of basic training, uh, the least individual in our company at, after basic training were assigned a permanent duty station. So everybody got assigned to a ship or shore duty somewhere, you know, in the United States. But I was unfortunate enough to get assigned to a destroyer ship uh, on the west coast. On, uh, out of San Diego Harbor there. They have a, a destroyer base there, and that's where they sent me to get a, assigned me to a, a destroyer. And I was assigned to the USS first F-U-R-S-E, and uh, a destroyer squadron there. Their, their duty was to uh, uh, protect the, the large ships when they go out to sea. Mm -hmm. Battleships, that's coming, uh, supply ships, carriers, you know. In the case of uh, torpedo, you know, we were the ones there to be uh, the torpedo. ones to track down uh, submarines or in, uh, intercept a torpedo coming in, mm -hmm. like a kamikaze unit. <laughs> Except a very slow, yeah. very one. <laughs> so, uh, so after that, you know, we were uh, just then about then the Korean was getting hot. Korean War was getting hot. So our squadron was split up. Not only that, but we were starting the Cold War with Russia on the Atlantic coast. So they they were anticipating anticipating the war to start in Korea. So they split our squadron up. So half of them went to Korea, and our half went to the Atlantic coast. So we went down through the Panama Canal, went over to the Atlantic coast. And our uh, home port there, when we first got to the Atlantic coast, was Norfolk, Virginia. That was our home port. It was a big old naval base there. Right, huge. Yeah. Uh, how was the the trip by sea? Were you okay, or did you get? Well, when I first got on the ship, I thought I was going to get sick, sick but not seasick. But I never did get seasick. Good. I got just for some reason. But all the guys on the ship that came out of boot camp, they all got sick. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they were peeking over the side. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I never did get sick. I don't know why. I'm glad you were okay. Yeah. That can be miserable. I've been <laughs> seasick. Um, and when you got to Norfolk, then that was a completely different uh, part of the country and a different uh, uh, bunch of people than in San Diego. Right? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. What did you think of that? Well, south of... Uh, Norfolk, Virginia, the people were very prejudiced against his colors or, you know, any colored skin other than white. That's what I experienced. So you experienced some racial oh, yes, uh -huh. prejudice yourself? Because I'd go down south to, I had a, a friend that was stationed at Camp Lejeune in the Marine Corps there on a base mm -hmm. in North Carolina. And we'd stop at these bus stations when I got there from Norfolk to Camp Lejeune. We stopped to make bus stops, and I noticed that these bus stops that had, that had a, a, you know, a separate uh, bathrooms for whites and others, you know, mm. which are colored or colored, you know, Indians or... Oh, my gosh. And uh, even had... Drinking fountains, you could not drink with the white people. And you, had you couldn't go to a restaurant with the white people. There was really prejudice down there. Yeah, and you hadn't experienced that ever before. No, in the West we didn't experience that because we're a mixture here right. on the West Coast, you know. What did you, what was your reaction? How did you feel about that? Well, I didn't like it, <clears throat> but you know, I didn't, I didn't make the regulations for the state or the states <laughs> in the South. So I remember one time when I went to Camp Union with my friend, I got on the bus. Just when I was getting on the bus, the bus driver said, you don't have to sit back there with them colors. And, you know, on the bus there's a white line where the colored sit on the back end of that white line and the white sit up front. <clears throat> 
I said, well, I'm not white, so I'm going to sit back there. <laughs> so I went all the way back and sat with the colors, you know. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Because I wasn't prejudiced against anyone, you know, but yeah. they made the rules, so. I was only abiding by their rules, you know. I wasn't white, so I sat with the colors. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the uh, other colored people on the bus were appreciated. Oh, uh, yeah. So I sat with this one guy, a colored man. And on our way down to Camp of June, we got started on the bus. And I had a pint of whiskey in my bag, you know. I said, man, I feel thirsty for a drink. He said, I, I, I was sitting next to this one old colored man. And, he says, well, I sure don't have any other one. I gave you a drink. I said, well, I got one. Maybe we can have a drink together. So I opened it up, and I took a swig out of it, and I gave it to him, you know. And he said, oh, thank you. And he took a big old swig. And I said, I don't have a handkerchief to, to wipe the top. Said, wipe the top of what? He said, well, I just drank out of it. I don't care. It's, that, that thing is almost 100 proof alcohol, you know. <laughs> and there's James around the lip of that bottle. <laughs> So I took it back and took a drink. <laughs> it was, we had fun going out to North Carolina. Yeah. Me and that old colored man. I got, got him a little high, man. We started talking, talking, you know. We became friends. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, so your your friend um, in Camp Lejeune, did you, were you able to keep in touch with him? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, um, I spent uh, New uh, what was it, Thanksgiving down there with him on the base. <clears throat> in fact, he was restricted for the base, so we couldn't get off the base. So I just stayed there the whole weekend for uh, Thanksgiving. And he happened to be a very good, we were raised together in Winslow. But he joined the Marine Corps before I did, and I went second. And uh, he was there for training. And uh, he was also a boxer. And he won the all all service middleweight championship. Wow. And that's all services. That's the Navy, Army, Air Corps, you know. Everybody. He was he was well well known. Everybody messed with him, I bet. His name was Lloyd House. He was uh, one of the uh, first Indian representatives of uh, Arizona in, oh. in 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 Phoenix. He was from the Navajo tribe. So, um, after you left um, left Norfolk, did you ever just go out on the destroyer and stay out for months? Oh yeah, we always had to be on you know, alert for battle. Be because we had to we had him in this cold war with Russia then you know, mm -hmm. and Russia was. Uh, sending uh, submarines out into the Atlantic. So we always had uh, naval operations with a sixth fleet. That's a whole sixth fleet of uh, warships. And we go down to the Caribbean for operation maneuvering, you know. Uh, and then we come back to Norfolk. And then we finally got assigned a permanent station, base station, up in Newport, Rhode Island, so we we transferred up to Newport, Rhode Island. And every winter we'd go overseas to Europe, to the Mediterranean and Northern Europe. And so I got to go to uh, many countries in Europe. So you did have some shore leave? Yeah, oh yeah, every country we went to and then in Europe, uh, they gave us leave on the weekends, you know. Oh, I bet that was really fun. Yeah. So I remember I used to tell myself, nah, I used to read about these different countries in, the, in high school in geometry, ge uh, geography books, you know. And now here I am looking at all these places. <laughs> all right. What was your favorite? Uh, I liked Athens, Greece. I had my picture taken there at the Parthenon. And then uh, Germany was a real friendly country to me. They treated everybody nice there. Good. And England was good. good. 
England and Ireland and the Netherlands. Did you, uh, when you were aboard the destroyer uh, in those maneuvers, did you ever uh, find a submarine or they found you? Or? We track them, but uh, as long as they don't bother us, we don't bother them, you know. Right. But as soon as they take you around to detect that you're there, they'll take off and, you know, get away from you, right? Because the destroyer runs almost 50 miles an hour at full speed. They can catch up with a submarine once they find them. And they catch up with them, you know, they, we got sonar, which is uh, the sound under the water, mm -hmm. and that's how we detect, uh, detect uh, uh, submarines. Was there ever a time when it was really tense, when you thought you Well, were... one time we went to, we went up to uh, Sweden. The king of Sweden died, George King, uh, George, King George V died in Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden. So we were there in Hamburg, Germany, and so to uh, the United States to represent uh, the military forces in Sweden for the funeral, we took a detachment of Marines up there to march in the funeral parade. Wow. And when we went through the, I had to go through the Baltic, Baltic Sea, and when we entered the Baltic Sea, our sonar picked up submarines following us all the way up to the, up to Sweden. Oh my gosh! But that and all the way you, out, you know. But that made you nervous. Didn't oh, it? we're on battle alert then. Yeah. As soon as we got into the Baltic Sea, we had to all go to battle stations immediately until we got to Sweden. Until we got out of there. Wow. Okay. Uh, were there any other incidences like that? Uh, the only uh, bad incidents we had, we ran into two hurricanes while they were in the Atlantic. Oh, boy. Going and coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really, I've never been in a hurricane. That's, that's really scary. You know, your, your ship goes up almost perpendicular. When it comes down, it comes hard, hard, and when it hits hard, the sh the plates on the on the on the destroyer are plates, and you know, it just rivets it together all the way around. And as soon as that destroyer hits the wave again, when it comes down, it just rattles, <laughs> you know. And uh, the only people that can maneuver around, you know, on foot, are those people that have to be on watch on the ship. All the rest of the crew are down in their bunks where they sleep, and they're tied in because you can't walk on the count of the hurricane. Oh, my gosh. How long yeah. did that last? It'll last uh, two days, maybe, two and a half days. It's rugged. I'll bet. Yeah. Where was that? What part of the ocean were you in? Well, we were up in the northern... Let's see, we were in France where we first got the warning that there was a hurricane coming in. So all the ships had to pull out of France, because that's where we were that weekend. And once we got out into the Atlantic, that's when we hit that hurricane. Wow. And you had two? Yeah. Where was the other one? The other one was coming, coming over from uh, the United States over to Europe. So before you ever even got there, you were yeah. in a hurricane. <laughs> but, you know, you go over there, and, and the Atlantic is really rough, man, especially in the wintertime when the wind's blowing, and that's when the hurricanes start coming in. Wow. And then the waves are about 50 feet high, man. That would have been really scary. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Only two of them, though, right? Yep. And you survived, obviously. Right. Here you are. <laughs> we were Good. tied in our bunks. <laughs> the only way they fit us is you throw a box of sandwiches down there, and you just pass them around in the compartment where we sleep, you know, that's how we ate. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you were in the, on active duty uh, till 1955. Yeah. Well, I spent my first three years on the destroyer, no, four years, because during the Korean War, we were uh, involuntarily extended for one more year of service by the President of the United States on account of the Korean War. We couldn't get out. 
so I couldn't get discharged after I had completed my three years. So I had to serve another four years. So at the end of my fourth year, while I was there on that ship yet, uh, they asked me, well, McLean, are you going to enlist or do you want to get transferred to shore duty? We got you lined up for shore duty. I said, where's the shore duty at? They said, uh, Point Magoo, California. I said, where is that Point Magoo? I said, well, it's over in uh, near Oxnard, Arizona. I mean, that Mark, Oxnard, California. Uh, just south of Santa Monica. It's right on the coast. So I thought about it, you know, I said, well, I don't know. I spent four years in the, in the Navy on a destroyer already, and I was tired of staying, you know, living on a ship. And I was ready to get out and go home, but it just so happens I happened to be broke, too. So I said, <laughs> well, I'm about to go ship over and get my shipping over money, and I'll get 30 days to leave with it, you know. <laughs> So I took the 30 days and shipped over for three more years, and then I got transferred to Santa Monica. I mean, to Point Magoo, California. Mm -hmm. and, and I spent three years there. What were you doing there? Did you enjoy well, it? Well, while I was still on the destroyer, they found out I could, uh, I could, I could type and take shorthand. And uh, when I first got aboard uh, the destroyer. I was doing nothing but deck hand work, you know, like mopping the floors, I mean the uh, decks, uh, cleaning the compartments, painting and washing out out on top of the deck, painting the ship. You know, just general maintenance work on the ship. Mm -hmm. But after I got, they found I could type and do shorthand, they asked me in the, in the office on the destroy if I wanted to work there, you know, they're going to try me out in the office to work as a typist to take care of uh, personnel records and to uh, type up the weather report every day. I guess I did good because they finally decided to send me to school <laughs> for additional training in uh, that type of work. It was called yeoman. I was a yeoman at that time after I was asked to read be transferred into uh, work in the office on the ship. So uh, they sent me to a Class B uh, yeoman school in Norfolk, Virginia. So they flew me all the way from Newport, Rhode Island down to Norfolk. And I was at uh, Norfolk for six weeks for that type of training where you, they take, show you how to take care of uh, enlisted men's uh, uh, personnel records and officers' records, you know, on the ship. Mm -hmm. And then after I completed that course, I went back to my ship. And that's where I started being uh, uh, a yeoman for the, for the ship. Did you enjoy that? I bet it was better than Oh, yeah, <laughs> it was better than doing deckhand work, you know. Yeah. Made this work. <laughs> Drink coffee all morning. Doing nothing but typing, and <laughs> I have to go to mass, which is uh, like a court martial. Mm. You know, for anybody that did wrong on the ship, yeah. go to board, and I go. I go to mass. I'll be the the commander's uh, stenographer, more or less, because I could take short on, mm -hmm. and I'd record the uh, the findings of each person's uh, findings. You know. What kinds of things were were uh, court-martialed? Well, a lot of them were fighting, a lot of fighting on the ship, you know. Uh, others are you get in trouble on the beach when you go off, get off the ship, people get drunk, rowdy, and all that, you know, when you come back. Or people overstay their leave when they leave the ship, they don't come back on time. So those, those are the different types of punishment you get when you go to, go to court martial. Okay. If it's habitual, you know, then they get rid of you. You get a dishonorable discharge. Yeah. And so you did that for the rest of the time you were in the service? Well, on the ship, yeah. 
But then when I took the shore duty, I got transferred to uh, Point Magoo and they have an air missile test center there. And they have an air station there. So when I first reported Point Magoo, I was assigned to the hangar where they keep all these jet airplanes. And what I did at the hangar was uh, I was in charge of uh, having roll call of all the enlisted men assigned to that air station there. So that's what I did mostly. Well, after I was After I was assigned to the air station there, about a year I was there on Point Magoo Air Missile Test Center, uh, I got a promotion to second class petty officer. And after the main office found out on the base that I had got a promotion, they transferred me back to the main office where I started doing assignment work for the commanding officer of the base. I did the same thing I was doing on the ship, doing court martials. I'd go to court martials, record it, type up the findings, and then have the commanding officer sign it, you know, to all our legal papers. And then on weekends, I'd, uh, we'd have uh, the whole base personnel inspections, that's where we had Marines and the Navy on the base there. So every weekend or every month, once a month we'd have a personnel inspection, inspections out at the airfield where all the Marines would march on the field and the Navy personnel. And I'd accompany the commanding officer, we'd go row down the row of each rank, Navy and Marines inspecting each personnel. And any discrepancies the commander finds, I take notes and names, and they'd be, they, they get punishment for whatever they, they hadn't done right or just they didn't dress right or something was wrong with their dress, you know, or their appearance. And I tried to take all those notes down. And then after personnel inspection, then we spent, we'd go to every facility on the base and then respect those facilities. That was a lot of research. Oh, that was a lot of work, yeah. Because yeah. you had to be very accurate. Oh, yeah. And I, then they assigned me to, on, that, on my base there, they had about four missile sites where they practiced launching missiles. And then, and then during my, I didn't have any court martial duties to, to, to attend to. That'd be a, a personal messenger delivering top secret secret messages to these different missile sites. I did that on my own. They assigned me a vehicle and I'd go to these sites with these different secret operations to deliver them. So I had a really responsible job there. Yeah, know? I'll say. <laughs> so while I was there, <clears throat> I hadn't finished high school. So I became friends with a commander of the, at the that was uh, in charge of the library on the base. And uh, I, I used to go to the library, you know, just to read and uh, check out books to read. And he noticed I go there all the time and he says, you know, he says, what are you going to do when you get out of the service? Because my time was coming up there too, you know. I was about to complete my three years there. And I said, oh, I don't know yet. I said, then he says, you plan to go to school or? Uh, College, or anything. I said, no, I said, I didn't even finish high school, I said. So I don't think I'll be able to go to college, you know, without a high school education. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, he says, have you heard of it? He said, you ever heard of the GD test? I said, no, I never heard of it. He says, well, I says, it's just a, a test you take, and if you pass it, you get a diploma equivalent, equivalent to a high school education. And with that, you can get into any college in the United States. He said, is that right? He said, yeah. He says, uh, what do you think about it? He said, I said, well, it don't cost me nothing. I might as well take the test. <laughs> so I took the test and I passed the test. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's 
So uh, at least I got an equivalency test, so I a high school education, you know. And I didn't know down the road that was going to really help me. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad I took it and passed it, you know. And so during the time I was at, my last year was there at, uh, at Point Magoo, <clears throat> I, I got married to a high school uh, girl that I knew before I got into a service. And uh, well, on leave, I got married, came back, and we came back to, I brought her back with me to the base. We got housing on the base. They, uh, we lived in, they had special housing for uh, married couples mm -hmm. on the naval base there. And uh, we had our first child. My first boy was born there in, uh, at uh, Naval Base in Point Magoo. What was the housing like? We lived in Quonset huts. They're two bedroom houses. Or uh, Quonsets, you know. Uh -huh. They were trying, made into two bedrooms. It was pretty nice. They furnished everything. All, all your bedding, your, your t eating utensils, dishes. Everything's furnished by the Navy. Oh, good. Yeah, so just move it in. It's all right. Just put, bring your rags and move in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did. And how long were you there? Oh, about a year and a half. Because at that time, then my wife got, she didn't like the Navy, so. And I just got shorter to the Hawaii, too, you know. Oh, gosh. So I said, how would you like to go to a No, 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 I'm getting loans for them. I want to go home. So I said, well, we'll go home. So I got, got discharged and came home. We all came back to Arizona. And my wife's folks were from Winslow, Arizona, too. So her folks, her father worked for the Santa Fe Railroad, and he was still there then and working. And then from there, I couldn't get any decent jobs in, in, uh, around Winslow. So I decided to go to Phoenix and I got a job with the Bureau of Indian Affairs the Department of Interior in Phoenix. And that's where I started with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, it so happens that the personnel officer there at the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Phoenix, he's an ex, well he was a, he was a reserve naval officer. And he found out I wasn't in the Navy. So he was the one that approached me when I, he hired me to work in his office in the personnel department because I had personnel experience, you know, mm -hmm. work. Yeah. So after he got me in his office, yeah, he convinced me to join the reserve. So I went back in the Naval Reserve there at my uh, previous rating, you know, mm -hmm. second class petty officer. So, but every summer I had to go on summer cruise you know, on the West Coast, got on a ship, or, and it was, I, I was okay with that. Okay. Kind of vacation, you know, yeah. with pay. <laughs> so, yeah, a cruise that so, you didn't have to pay for. Not that I've been there a while, my former classmates and friends from Winslow, they, they got into the service about the same time I went in, in 48. And they were already out going to college in Flagstaff. And then all, every time I'd meet them, I'd say, why don't you go to college? You know, it's not that hard. It's easy. You, you'll make it easy. You know, they should tell me. I said, well, I, I don't think I can make it. I already got two kids now. I got to feed and a wife, you know. So, well, we got kids too, but they, they furnish uh, married housing out there for veterans, you know, at the college. There's a place on college, uh, campus there called Cottage City, and that's where they stayed, you know. So they convinced me, and I said, Mama, well, I'm going to college. Why? <laughs> she wasn't 40 either, you know. I said, well, you know, all these guys are going to college, and I'm out here doing a, you know, making minimum wages, doing, you know, crappy work. <laughs> if I can get a better job, I go to college, you know, get an education. Yeah. So I finally talked to her, so we moved to Flag. So I went to uh, college in Flag. Did you use the GI Bill? Yes, uh huh. Yeah. So I got in with the GI Bill. I got a check from them every month. And we lived on campus, and that, in those days, 
in Cottage City where we lived on campus, the rent was only $35 a month, you know. <laughs> so uh, it was pretty good. And then, and then and, uh, of my off-duty uh, work, I worked at the sawmill, you know. So I was getting good wages there too. Good. So, so I don't work out pretty good until I graduated in 1962. What did you study? In I, I majored in uh, business business administration. Okay. And uh, after I graduated from my, uh, college, I went to work for the Forest Service. I got a job in Holbrook, Arizona, with the Sid Grease National Forest. And I was there five years, but I, I never could get a promotion. You know, I think there was discrimination there too in that outfit. And so I told my wife, I'm, we're going to have to move. I'm not getting nowhere, you know. I've been there too many years. So I called Phoenix again, and they said, yeah, come on, we're going to hire you. We'll give you a promotion, you know, to take the job down there. So I got, I got a promotion to go there. And I got into the branch of contracting, contract administration, which handled uh, uh, purchasing for different agencies mm -hmm. that the uh, beer interfaces are responsible for in California, Utah, and Nevada. They had the uh, Indian schools over there where we did the purchasing for them, you know, mm -hmm. like books, like school equipment. You know, clothing and all that. And then they had this Hopi Navajo reloc I mean, a dispute going on up there in northern Arizona. Mm -hmm. And they opened uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs opened an office here in Flagstaff, right across from the the uh, the courthouse in the bank. They're building upstairs. And uh, I found out about it. I says, I, just, I told my wife, I said, why don't we move up to Flagstaff, you know? I said, it'd be a lot cooler than it is down here in Phoenix. So she was for it, you know, to get out of the heat. So I, I applied for a job up here under the same branch from Phoenix. So they said, yeah, well, we got an opening up there where you want to go. So I tramped up here as an administrative assistant for the office here. It was called the relocation office, mm -hmm. where they were relocating all the Navajo tribe people that had to get off uh, Hopi lands, you know, that they were living on. Mm -hmm. And they were relocating more anywhere else out of the, off the reservation. And that's why I started up here in Flagstaff, the relocation office, as an administrative assistant to that office. and. Uh, then, uh, I don't know, we were here about four, four years, five, in Flagstaff. <clears throat> and finally there, things were being settled between the Tribo and Hopi Tribe, so we decided to close this office down. So I called the Phoenix office and said, what are you going to send me and they are going to close this down? And they said, well, we don't have no place, no openings to send you to. So you're going to be on your own, you know. Oh, dear. So I said, well, I better start looking for a job. And it just so happens that one of the engineers that was assigned to our office here in Flagstaff, he got transferred to Gallup, and he got a job there. And he was the one that said, called me one day, and he says, hey, Maxime, uh, they're looking for a contracting officer over here. If you want to transfer over here, it'll be a promotion, too. So I said, yeah, I can send me the, image, uh, the notification, you know, the notice of vacancy, and I'll apply for it. And I got the job, you know, so instead of me going, the whole family going to Gallup, I get, my wife didn't want to go to Gallup, but her uh, folks lived in Winslow. So I said, well, I told my wife, you can stay in Winslow, and I'll take the job in Gallup. Because, you know, I'm getting older now, and I need to get as yeah. high in my grade as I can before I retire. Right. And that's okay with you. I just come home on the weekends up from Gallup, you know, to Winslow. She, was, she, was, she agreed with it. And so she, we moved to Winslow, and she moved in with her parents there. And I went on to Gallup, and 
which I would gallop, and I'd come home every weekend on, uh, you know, to the family in Winslow. Mm -hmm. So I was getting gallop until 89, is when my retirement came up. <clears throat> and at that time, I received the uh, top job in contracting in Gallup. I was a supervisory contracting officer in Gallup with that branch. And uh, the agency I was working for, there was a, called the Navajo uh, Indian Agency Area, uh, area Office. Hmm. And we did all the purchasing for, Navajo, for the schools on the Navajo Reservation. All school equipment, all food supplies, anything related to purchasing for the Navajo tribe. And doing road construction projects, building houses on the reservation. So uh, while I was there, I became the supervisory contracting officer. And I was a GSA, I got promoted up to GS-12 there. And uh, I had uh, said I had nine contracting officers working under me. I had four purchasing agents and four clerks I was responsible for. And we did all the purchasing for the Navajo tribe from that office. So it paid off to move over there, you know. Yeah, right. Sounds like. But also, what paid off was getting my education to get that type of job, too, you know, mm -hmm. so it all came together in the end. Yeah, well, you were, you were smart to do that, yeah. to, to go back to school and, and do that. What Did you ever have any, during that relocation process, I know that was very contentious. Oh, yes. Did you ever have any problems with anybody? No, we never had any problems, of course. Uh, what really saved our uh, our problem with the Navajo tribe was that when we got out here, see, we had a police force here that we were supposed to furnish the officers on the res Hopi reservation to make sure that the, these people that live in the Navajo land moved off, you know. Mm -hmm. But instead of using the Hopi tribe policemen or the Bureau of Indian Affairs policemen in this area, the office here hired policemen from Montana, Billings, Montana, and North Dakota. And we brought those Indian policemen down here to Arizona, and they did the police work on the reservation out here. That was probably good, don't you think? Yeah, and those guys are tall, man. They're over six feet tall, those shoes. <laughs> you know, they're messing with those boys. <laughs> and most of them are cowboys, too, yeah. Yeah. Pretty rough people. And, and they could, and, and they didn't have to live side by side after no, huh? everything was over. Right. Right. Well, that was smart. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've been through a lot of experiences, you know, in, in life, and I went to places I never thought I'd go to. And I met a lot of people, you know, different national, uh, nationalities, tribes. I had a good, good experience in life, so, you know, so far. So, for you, it really was true to join the Navy and see the world. Right, right. it really worked out that yeah. way. Places you I were. even met people, tribes up in, um, way of the tip of northern Maine, that I became, you know, friends with. Uh-huh. I mean, I went, uh, I remember we went to Eastport, Maine, one fourth of July, and we pulled into port there. <clears throat> And I didn't even know Indians were living there, you know. And we were sort of walking in this bar, and me and my friend, we sat at the bar having a beer, and there was a big mirror there, and I just saw some people sitting in the back in the booth, and I noticed they were, they looked Indian. And I looked there, and I had to go to the restroom, so I got up and went to the restroom, and I went out. One of those guys in the booth, and I, I, I Son the mirror came and followed me in there and he asked me, Are you Indian? He's asked me. And I said, Yeah, I'm I'm Indian. He says, I'm Indian too, he said, he gave me a handshake, you know. He said, Welcome to Eastport. I said, Are you Indian? He said, Yeah, well, I'm Indian, I'm tribal literate. Just out of the side of town here. He said, Eastport is a really heavy forested area, you know. 
really beautiful up there. And uh, he said, won't you join us with me and my wife and sister sitting over here? Invited you to come over. So I went over and sat with them and had a beer with them and started exchanging, you know, mm -hmm. getting acquainted. And then I, he said, where, where are you from, you say? Arizona. Winslow, Arizona. I said, where's that at? Way on the west coast, I said. He said, mean they got Indians down there? <laughs> I said, yeah, they got about, she had about 15 tribes in one state down there. <laughs> yeah, more than in the yeah. coast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was all surprised, yeah. yeah. So I met friends with the tribe there, up there in East Port, Maine. <laughs> That's cool. Do you, uh, I know that you probably, or I assume that you probably spoke Hopi when you were a child. Do you still still speak it? Yes, well, I have to, you know. Yeah. To still, I attend all my ceremonial uh, customs and dances at the reservation. Yeah. Would you? And I go out there to do our traditional prayers, smoking, making our prayer feathers, and all those things. I still do that. Oh, good. Would you like to say something in Hopi on your on your interview? Oh, no, I just want to say why I'm here to have uh, people that recognize me for who I am. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, I want to let them know that our people are friendly people. Absolutely. We never mistreated anybody. I think we got we're too friendly with the whites, too, because they overtook our country. <laughs> That's the only problem we had, you know. Yeah. Well, at least but you I had. guess that, that happens in every country that has uh, the ruling hand, in other words, to say. At least you got uh, your part of your traditional villages back on your reservation. Right. Yeah. But they took a lot of land from us, too, you of know. Of course. It's yeah. Yeah. from the Atlantic coast. Mm -hmm. Every tribe, we owned this whole United States before the Europeans got here. That's right. And we were cheated out of it, you That's know. That's right. <laughs> but now that our our tribes are getting educated, our, we're, they're getting uh, the youngsters to take, uh, you know, go to college for uh, lawyer degrees. Mm -hmm. And again, we're getting smarter every day. Good. And now we're starting to turn back against the government and what they still owe us. Good. You know, like right now, Trump's trying to take our our uh, medical service away from the tribe. And that was promised to us in the treaty way back in, you know, when they started first taking over the Indians. Now Trump wants to take that away from us. So he's going to have a big fight on his hand. Did and you? the leading tribe that's going to do it is going to be the Navajo tribe because they're the biggest tribe in the nation. And all other tribes are going to join in behind him. Good. Did you, um, when you, I, I interviewed a Navajo uh, veteran not too long ago, and he, no, wait, I read this book uh, about one of the original code talkers, one mm -hmm. of the original Navajo code talkers, and in the book he uh, points out that when he was discharged from the Marines, uh, the Navajo and all the Native Americans were not considered U.S. citizens. When, by the time you came along, had that changed? Yeah. I'll Good. tell you what made the big difference in getting the GI Bill. After the Second World War, uh, we had the Mexicans, colors, Indians serving in the Second World War. We came out of the service, okay, we're discharged. We didn't get any benefits at all at that time. We got discharged after the Second World War. And there was this American Legion Club in Phoenix, Arizona, post-41. They're the ones that started pushing for uh, equal rights for those uh, People. Native people to get equal benefits as the whites were getting. And it wasn't for that post down there to push it. 
we would have never got the GI Bill or you know other benefits that we now have. Right. Wasn't Barry Goldwater, Senator Goldwater, wasn't he involved in that too? Well, he was. He was. He belonged to the American Legion. Yeah. He had to be involved. He was a good friend to the Hopi. Right. Yeah. But it went for that post in in, uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, post forty one. This uh, GI Bill would have never got really got started. And so but that's where it started. They, they started complaining about equal rights, and we had to serve that country for those rights. Sure. Yeah, and we weren't getting it when we got a lot of the service. So when did when did you get GI benefits? What year was that? I don't remember, but it was after the Second World War. Yeah. Okay. But by the time you were out, you you. you that was already established. Yeah, it was. You had them. Okay, good. But when my father got out of the service, when he was discharged, come back from Europe, he didn't get any benefits at all from the government. The only thing he got was maybe a, a tax deduction from his property tax. That's all he got from the state. But that was just from the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this uh, book I read, the Code Talker, they weren't even. They couldn't even vote. And no. Because they weren't considered citizens, and yet they. Yeah, that's right, too. Yeah. You know, Indians couldn't shameful. vote. Yeah. Um, would you recommend military service for young people today? Well, it's a good place for them. Uh, you know, like it happened to me. You know, I learned discipline, leadership. We're uh, able to use the GI Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Would you recommend it for young women as well as sure. young men? If they're willing to accept women, or if the women have a right, and if they want to join, they should have that right to join. You know? Okay, good. Because women are needed all the time, you know. Uh, they can always do a man's work, That's and it's right. being proven now. you got women in the Marine Corps, in all branches of the service. Even though they have to go through a physical training, they can still get, they still have that willpower to get you know to complete their course, okay. and they will complete it. Yeah, so you approve of that. And right now you got generals, lieutenants, officers, and uh, women uh, you know and the women on all the course. Yeah, good. Um, is there anything you wanted to add to your interview? No, oh, just that uh, I'm glad somebody took notice. About of us veterans, you know, we appreciate what you're doing for us to make uh, our our uh, our what we call comrades known, you know, to the American people, and it's good good training for kids that want to go into the service. Well, we but, appreciate what you veterans uh, have done for our country. If the mom and dads can't handle you at home, the service can. <laughs> You'll come out a better man. <laughs> You'll be able to cope with life, I believe, you know, in the future. Not only for yourself, but for your future children, you know. Okay. Because when I got out of service, I incorporated that training I got in raising my kids as being, you know, disciplined. How to respect people. Right. Not just certain types, everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for participating in this interview. Well, I enjoyed it. I'm glad I got it out of my system also. <laughs> and to uh, have someone listen to me as far as my history in the service, you know. Well, it was a pleasure to, to listen to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.